God is not just this distant deity with empty, boring rituals, but he was a personal God that was meant to be celebrated, rejoiced with, loved, and loved by. It's never about how you feel. And it's not about what we receive, it's about what we give. If you leave here today, determine whether or not this was a good worship service by how you feel about it, you've made it all about you. One time, my daughter, who y'all will get to meet here in a few weeks, her name is Carrie. She's my middle girl, and she's just so sweet and never complains about anything, but it was her birthday. And we have a thing in our house that whenever it's our child's birthday, they get to pick out the activity, the meal, all the stuff. But there was a problem because Carrie's birthday is on November the 3rd. And on this particular year, Thor 3 was coming out in the theaters. And I'm a big Marvel fan. And so as Carrie was picking out her activities for her birthday, I said, you know what, Carrie, would be great. What if we all went and saw Thor 3? It would be great. We'll all go watch a movie and then... My, my wife was like, well, when we're out there, we'll go shoe shopping or do some clothes shopping. And, and so we're like, Carrie's like, okay, that'd be fine. And then when it came time to pick out the meal, her two sisters were like, well, I want to go here. I want to go there. And so finally, Carrie's like, it's my birthday, but I don't get to do anything I want. <laughs> we're doing everything, celebrating, having a great time for her birthday. But the one person who it was truly about, we left out. How many times do we do the same thing in worship? You see, worship is not about us, it's about him. Nancy DeMoss said this, I love it. She said, worship is the believer's response to God's revelation of himself. It is our response to God. It is expressing wonder, awe, and gratitude for the worthiness and the greatness and the goodness of our Lord. It is the appropriate response to God's person, his provision, his power, his promise, his plans. Don't you love that? And there's lots of words. And, and, and I believe me, I had that one time this chart. I was going to show you all the Greek and Hebrew words for worship, but there's so many of them. But there's some that you know that, that means to serve. There's some that means to hold your hands out. There's some that means to shout loud and praise. There, there, there's one that means to, to kiss toward. Like, like, and it really means a dog licking its master's hand. And they're all beautiful. But they're all in response to who God is and what God has done. It's never about how you feel. And it's not about what we receive. It's about what we give. Now I tell you, I, I have a strong, I pray every Sunday that when we come to worship, it will be a powerful worship, that you'll be moved by it, that, that you will hear God speak, but that's not why we do it. When we come to worship, there's two key things I want us to experience. I want us to approach God with awe and reverence. And I want us to approach God with joy and intimacy. Awe and reverence and joy and intimacy. And we see this in our text. When we look at this text, we see the joy of worship. We see the sacredness. We see the blessings that come with it. And we also see the dangers of worship. Now, I'll be honest. This passage we read this morning is one that I've always struggled with for the longest time. Because I read it and I was like, that poor Uzzah. He was doing a good thing. He, he, the ark was falling over, and he stopped it, and God killed him. Why? But the more I've studied over the years, the more I realize there's much more to this story. And we look at it, it will really impact, I believe, our way of worship. So let's look at this again. Look, look, look at verse 1. It says, David again brought together out of Israel chosen men, 30,000 in all. He and all of his men set out from Baal of Judah to bring up the, there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim that are on the ark. That's the mercy seat. They set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it up from the house of Benadab, which was on the hill. Okay, it goes on. Now, when you look at the ark, understand the ark was very sacred, and it symbolized the history, the miracles, the very presence of God. Everything that, had, that the people of Israel had experienced with God was right there. But it was more than that. 
The ark and how you approached it and what you experienced there really was like a gospel presentation. It talked about how you were saved. You found mercy there. It was only through the priests putting the blood there. It was, there's so much wrapped in the sacrifice. You heard the gospel when you looked at the ark. You saw the holiness of God. You saw how you just couldn't approach God because he was holy and you were so sinful. But yet there was mercy there because the blood was applied and it was just so beautiful. And so you did not approach it any old way you wanted. It was sacred. It was special. So you did not treat it like everything else because of what it was and what it symbolized. It wasn't magical. It was sacred. It was sacred. And so this wonderful history, when, when, when God told Moses how to do all this, it was wonderful. But over the years, things changed. And people started to see the ark of God not as this wonderful symbol between God and the people, but it became more like a rabbit's foot, a good luck charm, like how many of us or many folks wear a cross around our neck, not knowing what the cross means, just it's a beautiful ornament. And so when Eli and his two wicked sons, and they, they were losing battles, and so they said, we got an idea, let's bring the ark of the covenant out. And they brought it out kind of like, this is our secret weapon. And it didn't work. It got captured. But now it was really neat. When the Philistines captured it, they put it in the temple of their God. And their God's idol statue fell down and broke. And then all the people started getting all these little bad boils and all these nasty things. A plague broke out. And so finally he said... We, we can't handle this. And so they sent the ark away. The Philistines sent the ark away. And they sent it away, and this is very important, by putting it on an ox cart. And they sent it out, and it went to the house of Benadab. When it got there, so some men looked, looked at it and thought, oh, wow, the ark of the covenant. Let's look inside. And they, they died. <laughs> and so... During the whole time of King Saul's reign, the Ark of the Covenant was in this guy's place. It was absent from Jerusalem, absent from Israel. And really, it's very symbolic how, how it, King Saul's reign was. But in our text, King Saul is dead, and David is now king. And one of David's first acts is he wants to bring the Ark back to Jerusalem. Now, some say it's a political thing, but no, remember, David is a man after God's own heart. And David says, I am now king, and I want God at the center of this kingdom. I want this to be about God. And I, and I want us as a nation, as a kingdom, to glorify him. And so David's desire is good. God is not just this distant deity with empty, boring rituals, but he was a personal God that was meant to be celebrated, rejoiced with loved and loved by. And so David gathers, you know, look, look, there's 30,000 people and they're all celebrating. They're, they're, they're having a great time. And David's excited. It's a wonderful thing. Because for David, it wasn't just God. It was my God. Not just the Savior, but my Savior. And so the celebration. 30,000 men, loud shouts, horns blowing, lots of music, lots of dancing. But do you notice how the ark is being treated? They were guiding the new cart with the ark of God on it. The ark was being carried the same way the Philistines carried it. It was being treated the same casual way. Why? Well, maybe that's what the culture said it's the best way to do it. Maybe it was just easier. It was convenient. Maybe David thought, me and God are so tight, I can carry this any way I want. And God's okay with it. Worship should never be based upon casual acceptance or upon what is convenient for us. And what is culturally relevant? 
The ark was holy and had special instructions on how to be carried. Only Levites, the priests, could carry it on poles. It was sacred. But now it's be treated just any other way. The worship that David had was joyful, but it wasn't sacred. I have a friend who went to a church over Christmas time up in Cincinnati, uh, where we used to live. And there was a church, and the pastor had good intentions. He wanted to be relevant, to, to really reach out to the folks. And so he, he did a sermon series, which I'm not against. It's based around the movie Elf. He had the entire sanctuary decked out like the North Pole. And then he came out on stage dressed up like Buddy the Elf. And he preached the whole sermon that way, the whole series. And my friend said that the sermon was relevant, was pretty good. But he said there was something missing in all of it. He said there was nothing sacred about what was going on. There was nothing sacred about what was going on. And so by carrying the ark this way, they had profaned it, they had cheapened it, they had lost sight of the holiness of God, and they had profaned the very presence of God. How can we profane our worship today? Well, first of all, if you make the focus all about you. If you leave here today, determine whether or not this was a good worship service by how you feel about it, you've made it all about you. We profane it when we fail to honor God as holy, when we remove the relationship from the the, the worship and we just turn worship to a bunch of empty rituals. But perhaps the most thing we're guilty of, of is when we try to make worship simply a Sunday thing and separate from our lives. Amos 5, chapter 21 says this, I hate, I despise religious feasts. I cannot stand your assemblies. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs, I will not listen to the music of your harps. That's God telling the people, I don't want to hear your worship because I know what you did Saturday. (laughs) I know how you treated that Walmart employee Thursday afternoon. We profane our worship. And so what happens is in chapter, I mean, in verse 6, Uzzah reaches out and he touches it. It's stumbling. And you think it's not a big deal, but it is. And so he reaches out and there's a big party. Uzzah reaches it. He touches it. He falls over dead. And you think about, wow, what, what a way to kill the mood. <laughs> And then the text says that David, David was angry. It says, well, David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah. To that day, this place is called Perez Uzzah. And David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, how can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? And he was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to be with him in the city of David. He was upset because he had lost sight of the sacredness. And sometimes, you know, we get so wrapped up, and we should in the relational aspect of God, that we, we get so casual, and we should because we're intimate. God is Abba. God is Father. And like I heard one speaker say that if Jesus were to appear here, we think that we just run up and just high-five him, and we'd be so excited. But remember, John, the beloved disciple, John, who laid at the breast of Jesus, John, the one who was known as the disciple Jesus loved, When John was on the island of Patmos and he saw Jesus in his glory, his first response was to fall down like he was dead because he was so glorious. Our God is an awesome God. And we can never forget that. And why is this such a big deal? We can say it was because of holiness, yes, but practical. The thing is this, you will only ever truly yield yourself to that which you respect. 
You will only yield yourself to that which you respect. And that's why a lot of times in churches we come, we have a great time, and we want Jesus as therapist. We want Jesus as counselor. We want Jesus as friend. We want Jesus as companion. But he is Lord. He is Lord. And when we come, we surrender all to him.